if you studied chemistry at school, it was most likely inorganic chemistry that you started from. The number of possible applications of inorganic materials seems not to be really big at the first glance, like minerals, alloys, cleaning agents. But in fact, it is inorganic chemistry that we have to thank for modern technologies, like aircraft plating, stuffing our smartphones and dozens of others. What inorganic chemistry gave us and how to become an inorganic chemist? Here we'll find this out. Well, logically, the first question is, what is actually inorganic chemistry? Inorganic chemistry is chemistry that studies non-organic compounds, their properties and reactions. Most sources will tell you that inorganic chemistry studies everything that is not organic. Well, this definition holds true, although being quite vague. It is tricky to embrace everything at once, since inorganic chemistry is very diverse and it may, its branches may have little in common. It is quite tricky to come up with a definition which can bring all under the same roof, since its branches have really little in common sometimes. We can give you an example and pick out basic topics of interest in organics. Thermodynamics and kinetics studies of reactions, synthesis of inorganic compounds, their structure properties examination, solid state and coordination chemistry. What kind of discipline is inorganic chemistry if you want to study it at the university? What knowledge you should have for it and which perspectives you might have with it later? Here are the answers to these questions. Uh, my research is concerning the green chemistry and a lot of things adjacent to that topic. And uh, the main idea, the main uh, research scope of the group is making catalysts for the world. So I was doing a degree in physics and my specialization of my research during undergrad was in quantum uh, physics of uh, materials. So essentially I switched to quantum chemistry, but the idea of research is the same. So uh, even though the education track uh, is like uh, different, like uh, education track of physics and education track of chemistry, the research track turned out to be the same topic. Green chemistry goes for two goals. Uh, one is the reduction of uh, pollution, and the second one is going for clear energy. What can they do? Maybe they can switch to something else. Maybe they can make the energy production safer in, in that regard. So we are talking a lot about like hybrid technologies that can merge like oil production. Uh, gas mining stuff like this like with green chemistry so it's like more sustainable mm -hmm. more nature friendly and of course car production and of course like uh safety of uh, and environmental safety of uh, general chemical production of general like chemical manufacturers well now you have an idea of the scope of inorganic chemistry and now let's take a more precise look at it and consider some important areas of its application Imagine you can switch on and off transparency of a glass and thus don't need curtains anymore. Something from the future, you say. But smart glass technology is developing today and we should say thanks to solid state chemistry. Solid state chemistry or materials chemistry studies structure and composition of solid materials. Mostly solid materials are functional, it means that they respond to the environment. Materials chemistry is one of the largest areas in inorganic chemistry and is applied for electronics, energy storage, sensors, drug delivery, nature remediation and many, many other spheres. There are sometimes even separate departments at the universities dedicated to material studies, particularly functional materials. Material scientists and inorganic chemists change the structure of a material to obtain new properties. For example, they can change a phase condition of a substance or insert some alien atoms in the composition of an alloy. By the way, replacing atoms in a structure for electron-rich or electron-deficient atoms is the way of creating semiconductors with different types of conductivity, P and N. A perfect example of such a functional material is silicon. It serves many aspects in our life. It can be electronics with microchips, environmental developments with semiconductors for solar cells, medicine with silicon-based polymers. They are all based on silicon materials. Oh. 
some inorganic materials are used for storage and release of high amounts of energy. Thomas Klapertke is an expert in energetic materials. He knows nearly everything about explosions, pyrotechnics and propellants. And my research area is uh, energetic materials. And under energetic materials, we understand not only explosives, but also explosives, secondary and primary explosives, propellants and pyrotechnics. Okay, the features you usually have in an explosive compound, uh, here I'm talking about what we call ideal explosives, are that you need to have a fuel and an oxidizer. And you would like to combine this in one and the same molecule. One of the most famous and oldest explosive is TNT, trinitrotoluene. So you have a six-membered carbon ring, that is a fuel. And you stick to this three nitro groups, which are the oxidizers. And if you trigger that compound, uh, it will decompose to form carbon monoxide, water, and nitrogen. And the decomposition reaction is highly exothermic. So it releases a lot of energy. The reaction is very fast. Um, it occurs in an ideal case supersonically. That is a, one of the requirements for explosion or detonation, I should better say. And for this, you need the oxidizer and the fuel combined in the same molecule. You, you could also mix two compounds, but then you never have really an ideal explosive and, and also not an ideal detonation. Right, well, our work is uh, to a very, very large extent related to defense technology. We haven't, I wouldn't say we haven't done, but we have done very, very little in the civil area of application of explosives. We are capable of synthesizing new compounds and these new compounds should have lower environmental impact lower toxicity. I can elaborate on all this in more detail, uh, but at the same time, they should also be more powerful. If you try to replace an existing explosive with something uh, that is, say, environmentally more benign, but has only 80% of the performance of the existing explosive, then no one would really buy that and no one would like to, to use it. Any employer in the synthetic uh, chemical industry would like would like to hire a person, I would say, with a background in energetic materials. If you are able to synthesize hexogen, TKX50, lead azide, and can safely handle those materials, um, you would be very suitable uh, for, for any uh, difficult and potentially hazardous chemical process. But as I said, half or more than half of my graders want to stay in energetics. First, I would like to say is if you look at our own synthesis, we produce high nitrogen carbon containing compounds. I consider myself as being a synthetic inorganic chemist. Now, what is the difference between in this area between organic and uh, inorganic chemistry? The dividing line is very, very fine. It's, it's not very clear whether a tetrazole is you know, really organic or inorganic. So good knowledge, good background knowledge in both organic and inorganic chemistry is essential and equally important. It's kind of stating the obvious, but often forgotten is, is very good background knowledge in physical chemistry. We talk here about detonation velocity, detonation pressure, reaction kinetics, um, thermodynamics, thermochemical calculations in order to predict detonation parameters, hydrocode calculations, and all this. So a good knowledge, organic, inorganic, synthetic organic, synthetic inorganic, and physical chemist chemistry is essential. Background knowledge, of course, in pharmaceutical chemistry, biochemistry, it's less relevant 
for our area. I would say the classical organic, inorganic, physical chemistry. The full interview with Tom Klopetsky you will find later in this channel. Don't forget to subscribe. That was about high energy materials, but some materials in turn allow to convert or store a small amount of energy. For example, complexes of metals and especially transition metals are highly sensitive to energy they gain or substrate they bind. This is why they are often used as detectors and markers. But this is not the only their application. What else can a specialist in inorganic complexes create? I'm a doctor of sciences in Moscow State University and I'm the head of the luminescence group where we are dealing with luminescence. <laughs> to enter the university chemistry department or material science department, as in my case, first year you have to uh, run uh, the scientific work devoted to inorganic chemistry. Then, of course, you can change the scope of your interest. And in my case, I just didn't change because this was rather interesting and I stayed in inorganic chemistry. Science today and inorganic chemistry uh, as well uh, is becoming um, more than uh, such a narrow field. Um, you cannot be just an inorganic chemist uh, synthesizing new compounds, um, running some analysis and so on, uh, you have to be involved in the uh, more broad research. You have to make something useful uh, from the point of view of some physical properties, for example, or some other chemical properties and so on. And of course, uh, you have to be aware of the fields where you have to use your compounds. In our case, it's luminescence. It's also uh, you have to be involved in optics as well, skillful in physics and spectroscopy, uh, X-ray studies, mathematical uh, background, if you want to be deep involved, deeply involved in it. But if you really want to be deep in it, you need organic chemistry, physics, mathematics and everything, I don't know, maybe except for the history, <laughs> but even here I'm not sure. Uh, so we are uh, devoted to the luminescence of coordination compounds of lanthanides. So uh, as they are coordination compounds, of course, we have to learn a little bit of organic chemistry because these are com uh, compounds with organic ligands. Luminescence is the emission of light after some excitation with the uh, energy source. For example, when you uh, put your banknote under the UV lamp and it emits light. Uh, this is luminescence, so the dyes which are within the banknote absorb the UV light and they emit green or red luminescence. Uh, the compounds which we investigate can be used as sensor materials, so for that we have to learn analytical chemistry, and also as uh, emitting layers in organic light emitting diodes. And for that, of course, we need to learn physics, optoelectronics, and so on. Uh, and uh, for luminescence thermometry, for example, for bioimaging, and for that, we have to also <laughs> learn a little bit of cellular bi biology. I don't say that we are specialists in this field. Of course, uh, we have the collaborators who are uh, real specialists, but you have to understand what they are doing to uh, run the successful uh, joint research. For me, it's really very important to go from the fundamentals to the real applications. The field of inorganic chemistry is not uh, truly divided by the type of compounds which are studied, but uh, more by their application. For example, oxide materials can be superconductors and they can also be uh, ionic conductors and they can also be sensors and they can also be semiconductors for uh, other applications and so on. Uh, so the field is quite broad and the number of applications is also very broad and of course in organic chemistry is everywhere. Although it seems that inorganic chemistry is more about materialistic aspect of our lives, there are cases when it directly concerns not only us, but the other living organisms. Let's take red cells of our blood, for instance. They consist mainly from hemoglobin, which is in charge of oxygen transfer. And what is the core part of it? 
iron atoms, which bind the oxygen due to change in their oxidation state. This is just one of multiple examples when inorganic chemistry helps to understand life processes. This branch has derived from inorganic chemistry and biochemistry and is called bioinorganic chemistry. It examines the role of metals and other inorganic substances in detail. That is what makes it distinct from biochemistry, which examines biomolecules in bigger scale of a cell or an organism. Bioinorganic chemistry again is focused on the processes of key inorganic centers of a biological compound. Usually they are active sites with metals. There are two challenges that bioinorganic chemistry intends to solve. Firstly, it examines the work of inorganic elements in biosystems which occurs in nature. For example, respiration occurs thanks to oxygen transport. And a lot of ferment work is based on complex formation with metals. And of course, don't forget about biomineralization that provides strong teeth and bones for our body. One challenge which bioinorganic chemistry addresses is creation of drugs based on inorganic or organometallic compounds. These drugs can mimic the behavior of real metalloproteins and control the action of some damaging agents. Owing to research in this area, we now have such developments as cisplatin, an anti-cancer drug with platinum, which binds to DNA of a cancer cell and stops its replication. At the very beginning, you will surely do fundamental science, but what can be the application of your chemical skills for the world? The career perspectives for bioinorganic chemists are indeed quite open. Many medicinal and pharmaceutical companies right now are in great need of good drug development and production specialists. And even if you are rather interested in fundamental research of living systems, you will also definitely find a place there. You can be sure about it. Well, we try to embrace as much as possible, but of course, the world of inorganic chemistry is very diverse. I hope after watching this video, you have a more clear understanding of what can be studied in inorganic chemistry. Inorganics is mostly about materials and technologies, although in tandem with other fields of chemistry, it appears in life chemistry, physical chemistry, and many, many others. You can put your finger up if you like this video and write in the comments what branch of chemistry would you choose. If you want to know more about chemistry, find chemistry fellows, work or just have some fun, you're welcome to our chemical forum. See you soon. Bye.